American stress levels are skyrocketing. skyrocketing. The survey says that more, more than 7 out of 10 US adults feel completely overwhelmed. People now sleep two and a half fewer hours each night than people did a hundred years ago. So you're most likely sleeping less than your grandparents did. Your dog is sleeping twice as much as you do, but you probably are sleeping less. Average workload is now longer than those in 1960s. An estimated 49.5% of young people have a mental health disorder at some point in their lives. Dr. Richard Swinson, he's a doctor and also an author of a book called Margin, said the following. Conditions of a modern day living devour margin. If you're homeless, we direct you to the shelter. If you're penniless, we offer you food stamps. If you are breathless, we connect you to oxygen. If you're marginless, meaning you don't have breathing room, you don't have margin in your life, we give you one more thing to do. Marginless is being 30 minutes late to the doctor's office because you were 20 minutes late getting out of the hairdresser. And because you were 10 minutes late dropping off your kids at school because the car ran out of gas two blocks before the gas station and you forgot your purse. It's supposed to make you laugh. But I'm guessing some of us can relate, so we're not laughing. We're like, ain't funny, okay? You read my mail. <laughs> That's being marginless. Margin, on the other hand, is having breath at the top of the staircase, money at the end of the month, and sanity left over after the end of adolescence. Margin is grandma taking the baby for the afternoon. Margin is having a friend help carry you the burden. Marginless is not having enough time to finish the book you're reading on stress. <laughs> Margin is having the time to read it twice. Marginless is our culture. Margin is counterculture. Having space in your life and schedule. Marginless is the disease of our decade and margin is the cure. Margin, in other words, if you're taking notes, write this down, is having a space between your limit and your load. We all have a load and we all have a limit. It's a common thing in our culture to push this idea that's not biblical and it's not even common sense. Doesn't even make sense that you can break your limits, you know, overcome your limits. All of us are finite. We have 24 hours. We have X amount of years that we're going to live. We have strengths and we have weaknesses. Having margin is having a breathing room in your life where your load and your limits never meet. Let me say that again. Where your load and your limits never meet. Where your expenses and your income don't meet. But there is a breathing room. There's a little bit of extra. <sighs> breathing room. If you don't have a breathing room in your life, if you don't have margin in your life, two things will happen. Number one, your stress levels will go up. Number two, your relationship, relationships, relational intimacy goes down. All relationships become superficial. All relationships become only surface. They're not deep anymore because it takes room for relationships to flourish. Even relationship with God. And the second thing, or the first thing that happens when there is no margin or there is no breathing room in life is that our stress begins to go up. As the stress goes up, we begin to develop diseases that otherwise wouldn't be there. Some people begin to faint and end up in an emergency. Some people begin to gain weight, others lose it. Some people can't sleep well, so then we medicate all of that. And so today what I'm going to do is first I'm going to address the spiritual part. By God's grace, if everything works out and I'll be here next week and you'll be here next week, we will address the physical component of living a life with margin. Because as Christians, we believe that the world we see was created by the world we don't see. We believe that the roots of our natural world exist in the spiritual world. Now think of this, when you see a spider web in your lawn, you know that there is a spider. When you 
see a tree you know there are roots when you see a human being you know that inside of them lives a being that you cannot see it's their thoughts it's their emotions it's their it's the stuff that you cannot put it through a microscope it's the real them the real world is spiritual world so if we deal with anxiety being overwhelmed depressed only with the symptoms meaning the natural world and we say we need to improve our schedule you know we need to wake up a little bit earlier improve on our diet add broccoli add walking you know go to the nature more you know turn off the computer limit the social media exposure all of that is great don't focus on success as much and focus on relationships more all of that has its place and I'll address some of that next week but if we don't deal with the spiritual problem and the spiritual roots of the problem we might miss walking in permanent freedom a lady came last week from a different state and she has a being that sleeps with her during the night and this being has physical relationship with her she experiences all of the feelings wakes up as a total different person feels angry upset all of that leads to her already losing two marriages so a lady like that she doesn't need just the therapy she needs to be delivered from that somebody here who hears voices in the third person in them they don't need to have a better planning of their schedule they need to have deliverance and some of you may say well Vlad you always go to deliverance the reason why is because the world is spiritual and so to ignore the spiritual roots to our problems would be similar to sweeping the spider web and never catching the spider and crushing it. So that's what today what we're going to do is we're going to deal with the spiritual things. Some of us in here today, our problem with being overwhelmed, stressed out and depressed has been passed on from our family. Some of you will look in your family and you will see that they've battled with that. They struggled with that. They didn't overcome that. This is not to blame your family. This is to recognize where it's coming from and to attack it at the root so you can pass to your children not anti-depression pills but better habits and better lifestyle. Amen. Let's go together with me to book of Acts chapter 16 and verse 16. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. Now I want you to notice that the Greek word for the word divination, spirit of divination, the Greek word there is python. Python is the word there. Now this is the city of Philippi. Let me tell you just a little bit of a background of what's happening with this girl. They believed there is a myth that was going on that a giant snake called Python inhabited the side in Greece called Delphi. Python controlled that place until God Apollo came and killed Python and then he took over that place and they even had a snake as a like an image of a snake on this site this temple site right there at Delphi so Apollo was this God that he had priestesses on that temple in the temple who he would possess and they would have information they otherwise did not have and they would give that information to people who would come and pay for it so kind of like psychics now and so and then through that information they would get money these women priestesses they were actually high paying priestesses and they were possessed with a spirit of Apollo or spirit of divination of spirit of python so when Paul comes to preach one of these girls that's working for this temple and most likely being a slave girl as well who predicts things is following Paul and saying different things and Paul of course gets annoyed after a while and he commends the spirit of divination in other words he actually commends the spirit of a python to come out of her and then she gets free and of course Paul gets in trouble 
Because anytime you do deliverance, you get in trouble with people. And so, so it's just, it could get you in trouble. And so he gets uh, in trouble, then God kind of works things out and everything becomes fine. I find it interesting that a demon takes the name and the nature of a snake or an animal. And it's common. You see, when you cast out a demon, sometimes a demon will say, I am, a, I am her husband. You're like, but her husband is standing there. And so, so who is this man then? She says, I don't know, he's, he's not her husband. Because the demon will take a role, I'm, I'm anger. The demon takes the role by its function or sometimes the name of a snake. So what I wanna deal with right now is I want to deal with specifically three traits of a snake called python, how it relates to the demonic tactics to our life. Now, do I believe there's a spirit of python? Yes. But I believe that the enemy, he takes the traits and some of these traits in snakes can be found also in our enemy. So I'm going to deal with three of them and then we're going to pray. For those of you who come today and need deliverance, we've seen in the first service, you will experience that. You may say, but that's not a deliverance Saturday. Yes, it's a deliverance Sunday. Because I don't want to pray for somebody who has depression problems that's going on for 10 generations and prescribe to you to download a better time management app. If your problem is a demon, there's only one solution that demons know and that is freedom. Your therapist probably won't offer that to you, nor is your doctor, but you can receive that at church. You can receive that at God's house, the prayer for freedom, and that can happen today. Like that lady last Sunday who was delivered, the demon came out and she was set free. Today could be that day for you as well, in Jesus' name. Can somebody give the Lord a clap offering? <laughs> Hallelujah. Number one, pythons can swallow the prey as a whole. Pythons have very flexible ligaments connected to their jaws that stretch around a large prey. Pythons, when they're young, they would eat rabbits, frogs, and other things. But as they get bigger, their appetites get bigger, they no longer waste their time on small prey. Sometimes they'll go hungry for days and weeks to wait to find something very, very big. And what they do, is they would bite the prey and then swallow the whole thing inside and their jaws would spread as they swallowed that prey. Watiba, 54 years of age, went missing one Thursday after checking on her vegetable garden. Local people mounted a huge search looking for her. They found her sandals not very far from where she went missing and not very far from there they found a bloated python. They cut the python and lo and behold, their neighbor was inside, swallowed alive. Now, when I researched this, I was like, thank God we got rattlesnakes. Those are not as intimidating. I know they're poisonous. I know they're bad, but you know, they're not pythons. Those pythons are big. I went for a prayer walk today with my dog and you know what I saw on the road? A rattlesnake and it was dead, like somebody gutted it. And so kind of looked over, I really felt that it was maybe a sign from the Lord that somebody's gonna get set free today. Come on somebody, amen. Amen. Now let me speak to you directly. I believe that Satan's task is to swallow people alive. John 10.10 10, it says, for the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. One of the ways he does that is through suicidal tendencies thoughts of suicide when the person gets swallowed up by the amount of pressure and problems they face they can't take it anymore and they decide to tap out suicide is the 11th cause of death in the usa and it's the second cause of death among the youth ages 10 through 34 and it's the fifth cause of death ages 35 to 54. Suicide is a permanent solution, that's what person who takes their own life, to a temporary problem. It's trying to solve something that's temporary by something that's permanent. Now please understand, the Bible has a lot to say about people who went through very difficult times and who wanted to quit, give up. 
One of them is actually Solomon. In his pursuit of pleasure, he reached a point where he hated life. Ecclesiastes 2.17. One of them is Elijah. He was fearful and depressed and yearned for death. 1 Kings 19.4. Jonah was another one. He was so angry with God that he wished to die. Jonah chapter 4 verse 8. Even Apostle Paul and his missionary companions at one point were under a great pressure far beyond our ability to endure so that they despaired of life itself. We see that anxiety, depression, being overwhelmed. I mean read book of Job, read Psalms. Half of Psalms is David walking around depressed. So the idea that if you're a Christian you always walk around with a plastic happy smile is not biblical and it's not practical if you live especially in the United States, inflation is high, get prices is high, everything is high. And so you're looking at that world and then if you add to that, your parents getting divorced, you add to that hearing a bad news from the doctor, you add to that having an accident, you add to that getting an attack in your mind. What the enemy comes is he loves to come and offer you a solution. And this is the enemy's solution. Your life is better with you not in it. The world will be better if you're not in it. Your hope, your salvation is in the rope. Tie a rope and yourself. All your pain will end. But as Christians we understand that suicide is sin. Because it's murder of self and you're not God. You're not supposed to take your life. You didn't give it. It's God's life to give and God's job to take. You are not God. Now sometimes Christians, anytime I mention this topic, I have people, well-meaning Christians come up and say, if I take my life as a Christian, do I go to heaven or do I go to hell? And I have a video about this or will come out very soon on YouTube. But how I address that question to those Christians is I said this, you're asking the wrong question. If you're asking this Jesus to meet you on the other side of your known sin that you're going to commit, why don't you ask me the question, how can Jesus deliver me from this? If you're contemplating, struggling with this today and you're coming to church and you want to know where you will end up, I want to tell you something that Jesus we serve wants to give you hope not in your funeral, but in His death on the cross. Our God gives us life and gives us hope. You may say, but I, I don't, you don't understand how hard things are. I don't understand, but I do know one thing is there is a spirit of death that wants to partner with you when you go through the valley of the shadow of death. When you go through divorce, when you go through heartbreak, when you go through loss of job, when you did something so stupid and you're so embarrassed, you say, I can't live with myself anymore. Like Judas betrayed Jesus and says, I can't live anymore. I deserve to die. I can't take this anymore. You must understand your salvation is not in the robe. It's in the cross. Our hope is not found in ending it. Our hope is found in going to Jesus and laying our life down to Him. When I was younger, I despaired of life as well. I didn't see a purpose for life. I didn't see future for my life. I thought that I was dealt with a bad hand. And there were thoughts that would come in my mind. I felt that they were mine. Now I know they were not mine. The thoughts were like this. Everyone would be better off with you not being here. I felt a burden to my family. I felt a burden to very few friends that I had. And I felt that God abandoned me by making me. I had extreme migraine headaches. I did not like the way I looked in the mirror. I had social anxiety. I had a difficult time speaking in front of people. If, you know, speaking is actually number one fear in the United States. Number two fear is being dead. So the idea of speaking in front of people gave me anxiety, gave me fear. It's something that I do now. I did not like anything and there's nothing I could do to change those things. So I felt as I tried my best to change my life and I couldn't. At the age of 14, how can someone come to that conclusion? They can't unless somebody plants an idea in their head. And I didn't know those thoughts were not mine. 
I praise God for a local church. I praise God for godly parents and I praise God that God the Holy Spirit did not let me and protected me from this. I knew I wouldn't have the courage to take my life but you know what I was hoping for? That God will cause an accident and that God will take my life. And I'm so glad God didn't listen to that because these were voices of the devil. Satan is after you and if he cannot destroy you, he would rather swallow you alive. I have a word for every person today that is standing on the edge maybe. Solution is not found in suicide. Solution is found in Jesus Christ. You may say, my life sucks, I can't take it anymore. I have something better that you can do with your life than to take it. Lay it down. Lay it down. Give your life. And that's what the Lord spoke to me when I was a teenager. And I said, I can't take, I don't like this life. Jesus says, give it to me and watch what I can do with it. You don't like it? Give it to me. I gave you this life. I know what I gave you for it. Your life was born on purpose with a purpose. But I said, Jesus, I don't see the purpose. He says, the purpose is not in you. The purpose is in me. Give me your life. I said, Lord, what can you do with this life? He says, just trust me. If I took dirt and made something out of it, can you imagine what I can make out of your life? If you surrender your life. Don't take your life, lay it down at the feet of Jesus Christ. Do not believe a lie that is coming in your mind and says, you know what, your life has no purpose, your life has no meaning. The best solution you have, you made a mess out of your life. Exit this life by stopping all this pain that you're experiencing. What the enemy doesn't tell you is you're stepping into Christless eternity. What the enemy doesn't tell you is by not trusting in Jesus to deliver you from this, not trusting in Jesus to forgive you of your sin, you are ending emotional pain to step into eternal pain. The enemy doesn't tell you that. The enemy also doesn't tell you that it's a selfish thing because you're ending your pain and you're transferring that to your children, your grandchildren and all of your close friends who do love you. The enemy doesn't tell you is that this spirit of death that is attacking you will have a legal fold, foothold now in your children's lives and they're gonna have to wrestle with it twice as hard as you did. You came to the right place to come to church today. And today the spirits of death, the spirits of intrusive thoughts, the spirits of murder, the spirits that want to end your life have made the greatest mistakes by letting you come here. Because the God who sits on the throne, Jesus who died on the cross has a purpose for your life and has an assignment for your life. If He can take a Ukrainian insecure boy with eye problems and headache problems and can make something out of him, can you imagine what He can do out of your life? So much more because our God is greater than any mistake you made. Your future is brighter than anything you've done. Your God made you. Maybe your mama didn't want you but God wanted you. Fearfully and wonderfully are you made. He delighted in your existence. You were born on purpose with purpose. And if you walk through a difficult season in your life right now, do not partner with the spirit of death. Do not partner with lies. You may say, but it's hard. Yes, it's hard. But Solomon learned to fear God and keep his commandments. Elijah was comforted by an angel and allowed to rest and was given new assignment. Jonah received admonition and rebuke from the Lord. And Paul learned that although the pressure he faced was beyond his ability to endure, the Lord can bear all things. None of these men ended their life, but they finished the race. And I prophesy in Jesus name, so will you. Suicide will not be your portion. Dying early will not be your portion. Your portion will be to live long and to praise God. Your portion will be to be fresh and fruitful even in your old age. Your portion will be that you will pass on life and hope and future to your children. And there will be a day you will stand in a different season of your life. You will look back at the hardest most difficult season and you will say I am so glad I didn't quit. I am so glad I didn't buy into a lie because I would have not enjoyed the things that I'm enjoying today. When I look at my life today and I said there was no way, no way in a million years I would have thought that God could use someone like me. That God had a plan for someone like me. If He did it for me, he can do it for you. Our God makes a way where there is no way. But it does not happen if you make an idol out of death. 
our solution is not in our death it's in his his death was enough your death is not necessary to end your pain there's another way and it's better way it's his way to experience healing from pain has anybody here experienced that deliverance come on those of you in the second sanctuary anybody here experienced that Jesus is better forgiveness is better deliverance is better salvation is better hope from God is better come on you can do better than that church let the redeem of the Lord say so come on some of you were supposed to be dead the enemy wanted to he came for the kill and wanted to swallow you <laughs> but God God stepped in you cried out to God and God answered and that snake was defeated and you were victorious come on somebody I just feel like just giving God one more time a little bit of praise a little bit of praise hallelujah I love you Jesus love you Jesus Lord don't give up on us when we go stupid don't give up on us when we want to quit amen sorry just a little moment me and Jesus over here the second thing that I want you to see that Python loves to do and that is to squeeze the breath of its victims so the first thing that I mentioned is they love to swallow the victims as a whole and I believe that I'm gonna reference that to suicide and we see this pandemic happening in our culture. The second thing is this is gonna, is gonna get, get hit home. Squeezes the breath of its victims. Pythons doesn't kill with venom. Instead, it encircles its intended prey and tightens its grip until the last bit of air is expelled. Pythons can reach the length of 32 feet, attack in an ambush, wrapping themselves around their prey, crushing it, squeezing it tighter as the victim exhales. National Geographic says something fascinating that pythons actually can feel the heartbeat of a victim. So they stop squeezing when the heart stops beating. They, they know when the victim takes the last breath. So when they circle around this victim, they squeeze it harder, harder, harder until you can no longer take a breath because you're so squeezed in. And the moment you die is when they stop squeezing because they accomplish their purpose. The horrifying study suggests that pythons kill their prey by squeezing until brain becomes overpressurized. Snakes can squeeze their prey much harder than the prey's blood pressure. This could stop the prey's blood flow killing a person or a being, an animal, quickly by carrying too much pressure on the brain, distorting, distorting its nervous system. Two Canadian boys, five and seven, were living below a zoo, snake zoo. And if you're living in an apartment and your uh, person on the, on the top has a snake zoo, move, <laughs> okay? So the snake escaped the uh, trappings, went through the ventilation, came to the, where the boys were sleeping. Nobody heard a sound. And in the morning, they found both, both uh, boys dead. And the snake around them, wrapped around them. Because that's how pythons kill their prey. If they cannot swallow the whole prey, they circle around it, tighten it closer and closer until you no longer can breathe which means they're after your breath. I believe the enemy of our soul is not only wants to take our life, he wants to take our breath. In the Bible, breath represents life. Breath is actually the Holy Spirit. Spirit is breath. God breathed into the corpses, the, the, the skeletons, the bodies that were lifeless and they became living beings. Jesus breathed into disciples in John and they became born again. The Bible says God breathed into his words, 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. All scripture is God breathed. That's why this is a different book than self-help book. Because this is God breathed book. 
when you're reading it, something is happening to you. The enemy is after squeezing not only breathing place, but a breathing, spiritual breathing in your life. Jensen Franklin, in his book, The Spirit of Python, mentioned seven signs that you're being squeezed by a python right now. Mark them in your notes. Number one, loss of hunger for God. Number two, physically being tired all the time. Number three is attack of lack. Number four is struggling or non-existent prayer life. Number five, super overwhelmed. Number six, old habits making their way back. And number seven, pulling away from the Christian community. Sometimes what we could perceive as something, oh, I'm just going through this. And it's true. Some of us are going through challenging and difficult times. But if you notice you are stuck in this place where your spiritual hunger is gone, your physical fatigue is there and you're eating right, you're sleeping right, you're taking your vitamins, there's constant lack, you're working, you're noticing this dissatisfaction with life, sense of overwhelm. You're like walking on eggshells any moment everything triggers you. Something someone does and you will just explode. If your husband, your wife or your children, like you feel like you're about to snap. And then there is this desire to pull away from the church. You need a break from everybody. Like, I, I can't take this anymore. If I see another person in church, if I go to church one more time, somebody's gonna get hurt and I will be in jail. That kind of a thing. At first it may seem like, oh, I'm just going through a phase. But if that's been going on for the last 15 years, it's not a phase. You might be under a spiritual attack. What if I were to tell you that in the spiritual world, what might be looking like in your life is something is squeezing, wants to take your breath. So you come to church, but you don't feel God anymore. You open your Bible and it's dry. You look at your children, you're like, don't want them anymore. You look at your life and you say, I don't want it anymore. And it's just like this, this deadness. You exist, but you don't live. Many people die at 30. We bury them at 60. They just exist for the rest of their life. Something is gone. Breath is gone. <sighs> Rhythm is gone. No breathing room. No breathing at all. They suffer, I call it, from spiritual asthma. The breath is no longer there. Life is no longer there. Movement is no longer there. And the enemy wants to take that from your life. He wants to take your breath. He wants to take your prayer life. He wants to take your love for Jesus. He wants to take your love for life. He wants to take your fascination with Jesus. He wants to take your desire to be in a Christian community so that you can be lifeless. If he doesn't swallow, he focuses on squeezing. And he doesn't squeeze all at once. It's just every month, every year. More things as you grow, more squeezing, more squeezing, more squeezing, more squeezing until you just say, I can't do this anymore. I'm done. And if the breath is out, if life is out, he accomplishes his purpose. Because he's a python. He's a spirit. But today I want to encourage you. You came to the right place. We are at war with snakes. Amen. Today as prayer is going to be offered, for those of you that are experiencing the very thing that I just explained, I'm going to invite you forward because we're going to pray for you. I believe in the power of prayer. I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe in the power of deliverance and I believe in the power of healing and we believe in the power of God. Can somebody say Amen. But there's something that we must do. Not only receive prayer, we must read the Word. That's inhale. Somebody say inhale. Inhale. When you're reading God's Word, you are inhaling God's Spirit. So for those of you who feel like, well, it's great, I can receive prayer, but if I go home, you don't know the life that I've lived. It's the same problems. How do I survive those problems? There's something that you must do. It's the way you live physically, is you inhale every day, every moment, and then you exhale. 
You inhale God's Word. See, some of us have been inhaling Facebook and TikTok for too long. Some of us have been inhaling news for too long. And it's like contaminated air. And you're like, Pugh! and it's just like, ugh, it's damaging my lungs. It's damaging my life. I feel more anxious. I keep inhaling Instagram and I look at the weight scale. I don't like myself. I look in the mirror. I don't like myself. We haven't went to a vacation and my friends went on a vacation. And you keep inhaling toxic air of social media. But God's word is God breathe. So when you read it, you go, you inhale in God's pure. It tells you who you are. Some of you, you're not inhaling the right stuff every day. Some of us came in this room and we used to smoke stuff and inhale stuff. And today I want to encourage you to inhale God's Word by reading the Bible. When you read God's Word, you are inhaling God's Spirit. You are inhaling God's life. Jesus says, my words are spirit and life. You may say, but Vlad, it's the same old book. The Bible is like air for a Christian. You don't see it, but you can't live without it. God, without God's Word, you can't live it. I want to challenge you. Develop a rhythm. I don't read the Bible to preach. I read the Bible to live. I preach the Bible, but the reason why I read it is because I'm a human being, spiritual being that needs to inhale God's Word. Any spiritual inhalers we have in this room that are inhaling God's Word? Anybody love their Bible? Love reading the Bible? Listening to the Bible? Memorizing the Bible? Meditating on the Bible? Living the Bible? Come on somebody, make some noise if you are grateful for B-I-B-L-E. That's the book for me. Come on somebody. I'm back in Sunday school. I pronounced that right, right? B-I-B-L-E. I now have to check myself. After Bryson did that dead, <laughs> there was a time Bryson was pronouncing dead from the stage. And he said D-E-D -E -D instead of D-E-A-D -E and stuff. So, um, but the Bible is the book for me. Can somebody say amen? That's inhale. There's one thing that you can do to exhale. And that is prayer. The Bible says, everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Paul says in Philippians, this about prayer. He says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. In other words, don't keep it inside. See, when you get the breath in, you have to let the breath out. When a Christian only reads the Bible, but they don't pray, they bottle, store their anxieties, frustrations, and hurts. That is not how you overcome them. You will blow up. And those of us who are men, we're like, man, I don't want to talk about my feelings. I'm going to talk about, no, no, I'm, I'm fine. You're not fine. You're a broken human being. And you have to have a rhythm. Now, you might not feel comfortable talking to your spouse. You might not feel comfortable talking to God. But please understand, you have to develop a rhythm. Breathing in, breathing out. Breathing out is Paul says, be anxious for nothing. I mean, he says, don't live a stressful life. And you're like, so, so what do I do? He says, by prayer, supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests <sighs> known to God. Let God know what you feel. And for those of us who struggle with that, read the book of Psalms. Read the book of Lamentation. These men, men of God, complain to God. Thank God. Confess their sins to God. But one thing they did not do is bottle everything up. And then had a problem where they exploded on everybody else or bled on everything they touched. We have to let God know what's happening. If God is doing blessing things in your life, spend time breathing in God's Word. And then spend time talking to God and say, Lord, thank you for blessing me. Thank you for my good family. Thank you for saving me. Lord, thank you for protecting me. If you messed up, say, Lord, I am so sorry. Wash me with your blood. What's happening? You're breathing out. You're breathing out. It's not staying in you. It's bre you're breathing out. And then if you're going through something very difficult, say, Lord, you know that person. 
I really want them dead. But God forgive me for those ones and just, just bless them. I forgive them Lord. But I'm struggling with them. Could you give me peace as I go to work and I see that demon, I mean not that demon, that co-worker. And Lord, could you help me with that? you breathing out the frustration. God is giving you strength now to endure those situations. There's a practical solution to fight the spirit of Python who wants to take your breath. And that is breathe in God's words, breathe out prayer, breathe out praise, breathe out thanksgiving to God. Call on the Lord and He will answer you in the day of trouble and He will show you great and mighty things. Like we were singing today, if you call on Him, He will manifest Himself. If you seek Him, He will manifest Himself. But so many Christians are going, Oop. No, I won't talk about my feelings. No, no, I got it. I got it. I got it. I'm gonna deal because your daddy taught you to do that. It doesn't mean you should do that. Let your requests be made known to God. No, I got it. No, you didn't get it because Jesus says He wants to help you. Let God know you need help. Said Jesus, help me. Amen. Come on somebody. Pray every day. I don't know how to pray. Talk to God. Let God know what's on your mind. But it's hard for me to talk. Try. Let it out. Breathe it out to God. What's weighing you down, letting Him know. Let Him know. That's the rhythm of spiritual life. You're breathing God's Word in, breathing prayer out. Breathing God's Word in, breathing praise out. Breathing God's Word in, breathing confession out. Can somebody say Amen? Let's give the Lord a clap offering. The last thing is pythons lay eggs and incubate them until they hatch. National Ge Geographic published, published an article about a corpse 17 foot long, 164 pounds. Female python was found in Evergrass, Everglades, carrying a record setting of 84 eggs. Pythons incubate them until they hatch. But there's just one thing about python eggs. They cannot hatch if there is not a specific temperature. So what the female python would do is lay on its eggs and shiver. Because when you shiver, you produce heat. That's why when you have fever, your body shakes. It's your body's way of raising its temperature by shaking so that it could fight infection. And so the female python would shiver around the eggs to produce temperature because the eggs that they make cannot hatch if they are not under a particular temperature. So three things we've learned today. Pythons can swallow. They want to squeeze. And the third thing is that they want to lay eggs. The enemy, if he cannot swallow your life with depression and anxiety and then end it with death, he will try to slowly squeeze it by being overwhelmed and taking your spiritual rhythms of prayer in the Bible out. But there is one more thing and this is a slightly undetected one. It's lying, laying eggs in our mind. Now eggs, they're not snakes, but they are potential snakes if incubated in the proper right temperatures. I'm going to deal with just one egg today and that is doubt. Why am I going to deal with that egg? Because that's the egg Satan laid in the Garden of Eden. Has God said, Satan put a question mark where God put an exclamation mark. He did the same thing to Jesus in the wilderness. Are you the Son of God? That means that Satan will try to put doubts when you're going through something dark about the things God made very clear and plain in the light. Have you ever had a moment with God and God gave you a promise? You shouted, praise God for it, wrote it in your journal, posted everywhere on Facebook and told what God's going to do? And then things got hard and the very thing that you were so certain of, God's gonna bless me, God's gonna bring me a husband, God's gonna bless my life, God's gonna open the doors, God's gonna use me, God's gonna heal me, all of that. And then times get hard, the devil will question that in the dark, what God made plain in the light. That's doubt. Doubt is not bad. 
if it leads us to God. Many men in the Bible struggled with doubt. John the Baptist was a great man struggled with doubt. Doubting if Jesus was the Son of God. Thomas struggled with doubt. Peter walked on the sea struggled with doubt when he started to sink. We see the different men struggled with doubt. Abraham at one time got kind of tired and decided to sleep with his concubine according to his wife's request because he wasn't sure if it's really going to happen. People struggled with doubt but there's one thing about this is these men did not let those doubts hatch. If you're taking notes, here's something to keep in mind about doubt is that doubt is questioning your, your faith. Unbelief is being determined to not believe. Doubt is a struggle faced by the believer. Unbelief is the condition of the unbeliever. Doubt says, I can't believe, I need more proof. Unbelief says, I won't believe in spite of proof. Doubt is honest. Unbelief is stubborn. Doubt is looking for the light. Unbelief is being content in the darkness. Doubt is born out of a troubled mind and a broken heart. Unbelief is an act of will. Jesus helps doubters but he cannot tolerate unbelief. Great men of God had doubts. Doubt happens when things happen you didn't expect and things that you were expecting did not happen. There's few things that you can do to overcome those doubts. Number one is don't miss the Christian community because doubt feeds an isolation. When Thomas was not with the, with the other disciples of Jesus and Jesus showed up, Thomas started to doubt that Jesus was really resurrected. Number two is focus on what God has done. We tend to focus on what is not happening in our life. That only increases our doubt, increases our unbelief. But if we focus on what God is doing, it increases faith. Number three, remember how much Jesus loves you. Jesus showed Thomas the marks that his sin left on Jesus and all the doubt that Thomas had vanished. Jesus' stripes heal our sickness. His scars heal our doubt. His stripes bring healing. His scars bring hope. It wasn't the wounds. It was the scars of Jesus that Thomas touched and the doubts were gone. When you look at how much Jesus loves you, when you look at His cross, when you look at that He died for you, those doubts begin to subside. Number four, call on Jesus in your doubt. Peter, when he was drowning in the sea, he called on Jesus. John the Baptist, when he was doubting, he asked Jesus for help, not the Pharisees. Demon possessed father, demon possessed boy's father, when he was struggling in his faith, he said, Jesus, help me with my unbelief. And Jesus helped him. God doesn't mind if we doubt, as long as we seek answers from him. And the last thing is speak God's word against the devil who brings doubts. Eve engaged in a conversation with Satan. Jesus engaged in a confrontation with Satan. Eve says, yeah, tell me more about how God is keeping good things away from me. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, for it is written. That means when the doubt is persistent, you know your faith, you know God loves you and it keeps kind of causing you to feel those things. After a while, it's, you know what? I'm sick and tired of this. Get out of here. In the name of Jesus, I just come against this right now. It's okay to feel moments of doubt. I remember when I ended up, I shared this a while ago, when I ended up in a uh, Muslim mass, a Muslim uh, gathering, I don't know if it's called, it was not a mosque, it was in the house. So it was a meeting. Uh, I went there to support my cousin who was trying to win a Muslim person to Christ. And when I went there, I was just a young teenager and did not know much about the Bible as I know today. Believed in Jesus. My parents believed in Jesus. My great-grandparents believed in Jesus. So I'm a Christian. It's like a generational kind of a thing. Even though I met Jesus personally, I've encountered His love. I know the Bible is true, but I wasn't faced with a lot of other facts contrary to my Christian faith because I was surrounded by Christians usually. So I go to this place and they gave me a Quran as I'm waiting. I'm watching in the living room downtown Kenwick. They're kind of worshiping their stuff and doing their thing and you know, Pretty scary environment, but all the windows were shaded. So I'm sitting there. They gave me a Quran to read while I'm waiting for them to finish their deal. And I'm sitting there scanning through Quran, just kind of looking at the stuff. I didn't know that you don't put a Quran below your waist because it's like, it's like sin in the Islam culture. And so as I was sitting, I put the Quran on the floor. And so they stopped their whole service. I thought, 
I thought I'm gonna die. I'm not gonna lie to you, okay? I was like, oh my God, this is like long bearded man, like, and nobody knows what I am as. I'm like, it's, it's over. Die for Jesus today. And, uh, and they surrounded me and for 15 minutes, we just went back and forth arguing about their faith, my faith and, and everything. And they didn't get under my skin. It's when I left there, I remember thinking, there's so many Muslim people, as many almost as Christian, who are committed to their faith. It's contrary to the Christian faith. How could they be wrong? They're smart people. I'm like, what if they're not wrong? And just these stars started to come. And of course I did what every teenager does when you're in doubt, Google. <laughs> you know, you don't go to God, you just, you go to Google. So I went to Google and I typed, you know, because this is what they told me right there in that meeting. He said, your Bible can't be trusted because it has a lot of mistakes and it has been edited to suit your Christian message. So I went on Google. I didn't do enough research at the, up to this point about the Bible. And I put mistakes found in the Bible. So Google was really kind to me, found me a booklet with 50,000 mistakes in the Bible. And I'm thinking, how could there be 50? No, no, I apologize. I think it was 10,000 because the Bible only has 33,000 verses. And so I downloaded the book. I got to the fifth page and I felt like I was an atheist after that. I was like, you got to be kidding me. This thing that I have my faith built on is, is flawed. So not that I became Muslim, but my Christian faith was shaken so bad. And of course, eventually I went to my pastor and I said, Pastor, I know I'm a youth pastor. I don't know what I believe. I got a lot of doubt right now about this whole thing. And I was like, did you ever endure that? And my pastor looked at me and he said, he had exactly the same thing happen to him when he was young, but not in a Muslim. It was communists. Communists convinced Christians. The reason why Christians were believing Jesus is because they were not intelligent. So Christian faith was considered mentally dumb. So this is what communist the propaganda was. That the reason why you're believing in your God is because you're all stupid. But the funny part, they didn't let Christians go to universities because they were Christians. So that they could stay according to them stupid. And my uncle, my pastor, he says this, he says, it was hard to go to school when the educated elite were atheists. And the only reason you guys believed in God was because you were not educated. So almost like Christian faith meant you're uneducated. That's why you believe in God. But the moment you get education, you stop believing in nonsense. He said it was very hard. And I said, what made you become a believer? He said it was seeing demons being cast out. He says, I knew something is different there. It can't be explained. It's something that's beyond knowledge. That this world is just almost like a replica of another world. And he told me this, he said, Vlad, every person needs to go through seasons of doubts where they discover their faith. If you turn to God, he said to me, he says, you will find Jesus to be worthy of your trust. And I did, found the book that clarified all the 10,000 seemingly contradictions in the Bible and other things. And honestly, my faith was anchored. But it was not anchored because I took it to Google. It was shaken because I took it to Google. It was anchored because I started to study my faith more. But it's not really where my faith is built today that, oh, we can prove everything about the Bible. Because the Bible is, faith is this, more than this. You got to trust in the Lord. And so you have to place your trust in Him. Holy Spirit helps us with there. And I want to encourage you today. If you are in a place where you're experiencing doubt, especially maybe you are a young person and you're watching at what's happening at the church and what's happening in the world today and the enemy plans to see, it's like, you know, is this stuff even real and everything? If you press into the Lord and say, Lord, reveal yourself and you read the Word and you say, Lord, show me your Word and show me the truth and study the Scriptures, you will come to the same conclusion. John the Baptist did, Thomas did, I did and many more that Jesus is worthy of your trust. He died on the cross for you. He wants to heal you, save you and change your life. Python eggs, don't let them incubate in your mind. By taking those doubts into the TikTok, like TikTok is the place where you can discover. Look, let me just Google my faith. Don't go there. Go somewhere where you can find the solution. Don't incubate those eggs by leaving the church, leaving the community, leaving good people in your life who can guide you and who can help you to get through the proper path. Amen. For watching this sermon, 
If this was a blessing to you, would you let me know in the comments below what stood out to you from this message? What are you taking home with you from this message? Also, if you enjoyed these messages, would you help us and hit thumbs up to this video and subscribe to our channel so you can get new videos every single week delivered to you on your YouTube app. If you go to hungrygen.com forward slash sermons, you'll actually be able to download the transcript, the notes, and the quotes of this sermon and the rest of all of our sermons free of charge. Until next time.